Hello, and welcome to AmericanNavalHistory.com. My name is John Sorensen, and this is a series of lessons intended to teach the history of the United States Navy. Our Navy has a long, proud history of being a global force for good. This lesson about the Barbary Pirate Wars will also need to be split up into two different parts. In the first part, I will discuss the attitudes and actions that led up to the war, the, the causes of the war. And in the second part, we'll discuss the actual fighting of the war. I believe that the purposes and the causes of a war are far more important to study than the actual war itself. But I also believe that the, uh, the war itself is far more interesting. So in order to give you both the important and the interesting, I will need to break this up into two parts. We have already talked a lot about the causes of, of, the, of this war or these wars in the previous lessons, like in the, the Navy Act of uh, 1794 and the Quasi-War lessons. But like I said before, history does not draw solid boundary lines between events. Many different issues do happen simultaneously at the same time. So now those things will be brought together in a different context as, as they have to do with the, the Barbary Wars. Okay, now, as, as we read this slide, take a good look at that first line. Foreign trade is very profitable for American merchants. Money makes the world go round. I do not believe that I, can, that I can name a war that was fought over anything except for money, or at least some form of money, land, riches, gold, silver. There, I, I, just, I cannot think of any war that was not fought over money. Okay, and, and at this time in the, in the late 18th century, Americans were a seafaring people. We, we talked about that, I think, one of the very early lessons. And the, we were trading with nations all around the world. Trading was very profitable for American merchants in the 18th century. Except for every time that an American merchant ship went into the Mediterranean Sea, it would be robbed by a pirate ship out of one of the Barbary states. These pirates split their booty or their prize winnings with their local kings so that they would be given, given a safe berthing in their ports. So basically the kings would let these pirates live in their ports and, and live in their towns and, and have safe refuge and um, go out and rob whoever happened to be sailing his ship by. From the time of the American Revolution, the, the American government really did not have a good way of dealing with the Barbary pirates. Um, they were protected by the Barbary states, which were in the northern part of Africa on the uh, Mediterranean Sea mostly. And um, they, they pretty much, any American ship that they could find, they, they pretty much captured it, uh, brought the brought the crew in and sold them as slaves in, in uh, North Africa. And they and whatever cargo was on the ship, they just took it, and the ship itself they would take. And um, any American ship sailing in the Mediterranean was, was fair game as they saw it to be, to be captured, and the crews were, were there to be, to be made slaves out of. And um, Amer the American government tried to negotiate with them to, to pay a, basically a, a bribe or what they call a tribute. And if we paid them a tribute, they would, they would allow our ships to have safe passage throughout the Mediterranean Sea. And um, the problem with this was the tribute was never enough. You know, if you if you if you if you paid them one dollar, they would want two dollars. If you paid them two dollars, they would want three dollars. And if you paid the if you paid the king of Algiers um, a certain amount of money, the king of Tunis would say, "How come he gets that much money and you don't give me that much money?" And so his price went up, and they never really were able to 
settle on a, an amount, and they weren't really dealing seriously with the United States because they knew that they they do better by capturing our ships and, and enslaving our sailors than they would ever than we would ever be willing to pay them. So they didn't really negotiate in good faith um, until about um, what in, in 1793. Um, the the war between Portugal and Algiers ended, and all of a sudden, these Barbary pirates were no longer bottled up in the Mediterranean Sea. You see, the Portuguese navy was a, was a was a, was a big navy, was a strong navy, and they kept the Straits of Gib and they kept patrolling the Straits of Gibraltar, and they would not let any of the Barbary ships outside into the Atlantic Ocean. So pretty much the American ships were safe to sail, you know, in the Atlantic Ocean all around the world. And uh, but when they got into the Mediterranean Sea, they were endangered from these pirates, from these Barbary pirates. But um, after 1793, the um, basically the the cork was off the bottle, and the Barbary pirates were sailing all around the world, and that that created a lot of pressure in America to form to build a navy of our own and um, by 1794 we did build a navy and at that point 1794 the um, Barbary pirates decided to um, deal more more straightforwardly with us and pretty much set a price for a tribute the bribe that would be paid and and if we paid that if we paid that bribe our merchant ships would get safe passage wherever they were, but that was only that was only after we had passed the Navy Act and started building warships that that would fight back against them. And until then, we were basically at their mercy. Well, when you when the United States first attempted to negotiate a tribute price or a or how much were we going to pay for a bribe to allow our merchants our merchant vessels safe passage the the Barbary kings they they would not negotiate but um, after the Navy Act of 1794 they begin to talk more reasonably and a tribute price was agreed upon now the first tribute payment to the to, to the king of Algiers or what they call the die of Algiers um, the payment was late um, so the United States had to give him a, a frigate to satisfy him. And when the, when the Bashaw, or that was a, a, of Tripoli, um, when he heard that America was paying a higher tribute um, to Algiers than, than we were paying to him, he felt insulted and he raised his price. Even though we had already negotiated a, a deal, he raised the price. As, as long as, and as long as America was willing to to pay and 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 not confront the pirates at sea, we had no choice but to pay the higher price. So, the Bashaw of Tripoli um, sent a message to the to uh, President Adams demanding a higher tribute, and and he and he gave him a six month deadline. He said, you know, pay us this higher price within six months, or else we're going to go to war against you. Um, and there seemed to be no limit to the end of, of the situation. Um, and Amer America was being blackmailed, and there was nothing that we could do about it, about, about the situation. They were going to rob our ships at sea, and, and without a Navy, there really wasn't much that we could do about it. Okay, back to William Bainbridge. Remember, he was the captain of the USS Retaliation during the Quasi War with France, and it was it was the only American vessel captured by the French during that war. He was sent out on a small ship to investigate two ships that were seen in the West Indies. Well, he found them, and they were two large uh, French warships that outnumbered him two to one and outgunned them eighty to twelve. Eighty to twelve. Um, so he had no choice but to surrender, and um, you know, so you know, his his luck's not been real good so far, and, and, and it's going to get worse, you know, in this war. Uh, now, skip ahead two more years to the year 1800 and 4,000 4, miles away in the Mediterranean Sea, and um, 
President Adams gave him a task of delivering the annual tribute or the annual bribe to the die of Algiers. So he, he departed on his, on his mission in, in early 1800, in the spring of 1800, and when he arrived in Algiers, his ship um, was in the port, under, right, and it was sitting right under the guns of a local fort. So he was basically, when he came in and parked, he was at their mercy. So the die of Algiers, he took advantage of the situation and explained to uh, Captain Bainbridge that as long as America um, paid them the tribute, they were going to be his slave. I mean, he knew he knew they had us over a barrel. We had to do what he wanted. So he he called uh, Captain Bainbridge his slave, and he threatened to sink the ship and enslave its crew. And to demonstrate American servitude to him, he ordered uh, Captain Bainbridge to transport his ambassador to Constantinople um, al along with a hundred of his guests and, and a hundred of his servants and many animals. So 200 people and a lot of animals and, um, he needed to, to transport to Turkey or, or actually to the Ottoman Empire. Okay, it, um, he, he would not accept his tribute until this errand was completed. So Captain Bainbridge, Bainbridge, he really had no choice but to, but to perform the task that uh, this king had asked him to do. Okay, so he he went and he did this job. He delivered the ambassador, the passengers, the the animals, um, and the um, and a tribute that the die of Algiers had to pay to the Sultan of Constantinople. Um, and the the Sultan had never heard of the United States before. But he liked the fact that um, there, was, there was a constellation of stars on the American flag, just like their flag had. So immediately um, he, he liked Captain Bainbridge. And, and Bainbridge made a good impression on the Sultan. And um, see, the Sultan was, was the head of the whole Ottoman Empire, which included the Barbary states. So the, the Barbary kings, or the die of Algiers, was under this Sultan. And... Um, the Sultan gave gave Bainbridge something called a a a firman. Now this firman is basically it's a it's an order from the king. It's an edict. It's a um, it's a proclamation. And when um, when when Bainbridge got back to Algiers, the the die was going to capture him and the ship that he was on, the the George Washington, and he was going to enslave the crew. Um, but but Bainbridge showed him the the Sultan's firman, and this caused the um, the die to to release the ship and the crew. So he basically he respected the order that he had gotten from the Sultan. You know that, that he accepted that the Sultan had befriended Captain Bainbridge, and he let Captain Bainbridge and his ship and crew go. You see, the attitude of the the the, the die was very uh, contemptuous. Um, they knew that America was willing to pay large sums of money to satisfy them, and so they kept raising the price and humiliating um, American diplomats. And they would do this because they, they knew that America was just not willing to fight them. Now, during the year 1800, um, Thomas Jefferson was running for president against um, John Adams. John Adams was running for his second term as president. Um, remember, Thomas Jefferson was a member of the Continental Congress, an author of the Declaration of Independence. You know, he did not attend the, the Constitutional Convention during the summer of 1787. He was in Paris sending um, history and philosophy books to his good friend James Madison. Now, James Madison was the author of the Constitution. Um, Jefferson was 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 one of the very libertarian members of our founding fathers. His views favored um, personal freedom, liberty, and smaller, more localized government um, to, be, to be closer to the people. It would be easier for a citizen to resolve an issue at the local courthouse or the state capitol rather than the far federal government office, you know, at, at the national capitol. So he... he he always wanted a smaller, more local government to have more power than the far-off federal government. It was closer to the people. 
So Jefferson became an anti-federalist, and he was against the strong federal government that would have the power to tax the citizens and an army um, to, enforce, to enforce those taxes. Uh, he was opposed to having a navy because the navy ex was expensive, and that would lead to higher taxes, and, and higher taxes would lead to even more, op more oppression to enforce them. So after the ratification of the Constitution in 1788, the anti-federalists who had lost that, um, that the um, ratification battle, the anti-federalists lost the ratification battle because the Constitution was ratified. Okay, um, they formed the Republican Party. Although these Republicans were for smaller government um, with less personal, with more personal liberties and lower taxes, they have no organizational connection with today's Republican Party. Um, they actually uh, were the forebearers, the forebearers of today's Democratic Party. Um, now, President Adams, um, who was president from 1796 to 1800, was was anxious to build a bigger navy. He he created the Navy Department as a separate department of the government and oversaw a large shipbuilding program. Not to mention the quasi war with France, in which which he fought a war totally at sea. So, so from ninety six to eighteen from seventeen ninety six to eighteen hundred, you know John Adams was president and he was like a pro Navy guy and. Um, Running against him was um, Thomas Jefferson, who wanted to um, deflate the whole Navy. Now let me take a minute to uh, talk about the election of 1800. Uh, the election of 1800 was probably the most controversial election in American history, and that, that, even, in, that even includes the George W. Bush against Al Gore of the year 2000, I think the um, the Jefferson Adams election was more controversial than the Bush versus Gore. Let me take a minute or two to talk about um, that election. Now, Adams was the incumbent. He had served one term and was running for re-election. Now, fortunately for him, the repercussions of the Alien and Sedition Acts were looming strong. Now, you see, these acts stripped away the constitutional rights. They, they stripped away a lot of the um, Bill of Rights, the, um, the freedom of speech, and uh, John Adams' Federalist Party was totally responsible for that. Now, John Adams, they say, he was, he was off when this was happening. You know, he, he took a six-month um, sabbatical while he was president, and, um, you know, they didn't need him. He was, just, he was only the president, but... Um, but when 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 um, the Federalists passed the Alien and Sedition Acts, um, it was mostly the work of Alexander Hamilton. But since Hamilton was a Federalist and uh, John Adams was a Federalist, and uh, all the Federalists paid the price for that, and um, John Adams paid the biggest price because he was he was he was a man in charge. He was a president, so he got blamed and he lost he lost the reelection. Um, mostly because of the Alien and Sedition Acts. Now, back then, presidents were elected by the Electoral College, who were sent there by their state governments uh, to make their votes. Now, today, the Electoral College um, is selected by the people of each state vote for their electors. Now. Back then, it was the um, the state legislature would vote for the electors to to go to be in the electoral college, and they would be sent to do what the state wanted, what the state legislature wanted them to do. Okay, the person who received the second place in the voting for president became the vice president. Now, each elect each electoral college voter was given two votes. So, so that they could vote for a a president and a vice president, but there were two votes for president, and the guy who got second place would be the vice president. Now, see, that is how Thomas Jefferson became John Adams' vice president, even though they were from different parties. They were from different political parties. It was because um, Thomas Jefferson got second place in the election, so he became the vice president. And, see, the Republicans wanted to, in, in 1800 now, um, the Republicans wanted to elect, Thomas Jefferson as their president and Aaron Burr as the vice president. 
so John, John Adams was so disliked that they thought that they could get first and second place in the vote. And they knew that um, John Adams would be a far distant third place. Okay, and, th and that is what happened. Everybody who voted for Jefferson also voted for Burr, intending for Burr to be the vice president. So Jefferson and Burr tied. They both had the same amount of votes. And, and the, the, the rule was back then that when, when the vote was tied, they would go to Congress, and, and the Congress would, would vote for who would be the president. You know? And at that point, um, Aaron Burr, he decided that, hey, you know, I'm. Why don't I run? Why don't I become the president instead of vice president? You know, he decided, He changed his mind. He says, "Oh, you know, I know I was pretty much in this to be the vice president, but hey, I got the same number of votes, so, so it's it's between me and Jefferson who's going to be the president." And he thought he had enough support in Congress that he could actually beat Jefferson. So um, Congress voted a tie, and they re-voted a tie. The Congress voted between. Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr 36 times, and they were all tied. Then all of a sudden, what happened was Alexander Hamilton, who disagreed with almost everything that, that Thomas Jefferson stood for on, on just about every issue, uh, as much as he disagreed with, with um, Thomas Jefferson, he hated Aaron Burr. And, and he did respect Jefferson. He disagreed with Jefferson, but he respected Jefferson. So Hamilton, he, he went around Congress and got people to, to change their votes and supported Jefferson. And, and then Jefferson won the election, and Burr became vice president. And it was, it was just a few years after that that Aaron Burr killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel. Yeah, they got the pistols out, um, took 20 paces, faced each other, and fired. And um, Aaron Burr killed, killed uh, Alexander Hamilton. So with all that being said, what, what does all this have to do with Navy history? Okay, see, Jefferson, want, Jefferson his big thing, the, you know, he was, he was a small government guy, okay? He wanted to downsize the Navy. He wanted to cut the Navy down to 13 frigates, and he wanted seven of those to be in mothballs. He, he wanted to reduce the Navy um, to a small group of, of gunboats to defend the Atlantic coast. You know, just put in these, these small gunboats, he would put about, about four men on them and, and, you know, two cannons or one cannon and, and just float them in the, in the um, inlets and keep, keep the bad guys out. And that, that was it. That was all he wanted for a Navy. Um, and maybe some forts on the hills, you know, by the inlets, okay? So the, the Navy situation, you know, was, was everything was downsizing and, and they were laying off sailors and uh, laying off officers. And there was just, hey, there was, there was no future in the Navy. And the Navy situation was so gloomy that the first four men selected to be the Secretary of the Navy actually refused to take the job. So Benjamin Stoddard, you know, he retained the position in the, in the Jefferson administration. Now remember, Adams had hired him to build the Navy up bigger, and he, he kept the job working for Jefferson, who's telling him to chop the Navy down. Okay. Um, so Jefferson won the election, and um, nine days after he came into office, he received a message from the king of Tripoli that um, was, was asking for a, a tribute demand to be, asking for a larger tribute demand, and he gave him, six, and he gave him a six-month deadline to, to, hey, you pay this, you pay this higher tribute, and you got six months to pay it, or else we're going to go to war. Okay, and, the, and when he received the message, the message was already five months old, you know, when he received it. And a few weeks later, in April 1801, um, Jefferson received Bainbridge's message about the way he had been treated by, by the king of Algiers. So, so at this point, Jefferson... Um, at this point, Jefferson assembled a task force to go over to the Mediterranean to observe, you know, see what's going on, you know, you know send, send the ships from America over to the Mediterranean, see what's going on, see how these ships operate, um, talk to, you know, 
just talk to the people around there, find out what's going on, and um, set up convoys of American merchant ships and protect the American merchant ships while you're there. Okay, that, that's where we need to we need to stop this for now. Uh, America had been trying to pay off bribes to the Barbary pirates to allow them um, safe passage of the of the American merchant fleets, but the blackmailers they they were never satisfied and they com they continually demanded more and more and higher and higher tribute payments. And then then America elected a president who wanted to make huge reductions in the size and the cost of the United States Navy. But as author um, Stephen Howarth wrote about Thomas Jefferson, in this instance, he decided nation above party. My name is John Sorensen, and thank you for listening to AmericanNavalHistory.com.